All right, Sheena, can you hear me? It's not on. No, this. How about now? Good. I could hear that. All right, welcome to the February 20th meeting of Soquel Creek Water District. Um, roll call. Director Balboni. Present. Vice President Lather. Here. Director LeHue. Director Christensen is absent. She's minutes away. Thank you. And President Jaffe. I'm here. All right. I'm going to rearrange things a little bit, and I'll tell you why I'm rearranging them. Um, so as you know, uh, there's no public hearing outside of 7.3, which is on the rates. Um, and there were written protests that were turned in ahead of time, but you still can turn in a written protest until the end of public comment on, on that item. Um, I'm show of hands. Everyone's here for the, for the rates. That's what I thought. Okay. So, um, right now we have, uh, an item 7.2 consider approval of a contract amendment for professional legal and litigation services related to Pure Water Soquel program. Um, as long as uh, our staff is not, is done with counting the protests, which it, like I, you has to be written and it has to be turned in by the end of, of uh, the public comment, then uh, we'll, we'll pull that and we'll put that after item 7.3. But I am gonna, gonna go through the, so, some very quick items before we do that. So. Um, Director Jaffe. Yes. President Jaffe. Were you also thinking about oral communications too in order to. Oh yes, I'm oral communications. I'm gonna, this is in the interest of time and respecting everybody's time. We'll, we'll do that after item 7.3. Um, and item six we'll also do after, it will do that right before uh, the oral and written communications. And then the last item will be closed session. And, and I'd just like to comment, uh, the oral communications is about any item not on the agenda not about items that are on the agenda. He's trying to facilitate it so we don't keep you here all night with the item you're interested in. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. So with that, okay, I just want to reiterate that the protests have to be in written form to be counted. If you make a, a comment, an oral comment, that does not count as a protest. And those have to be turned in. If you could turn them in as soon as possible, if you have them, that will facilitate the county of them, which is going to be done in the, is it the back of the room or front of the room? It, it is. Uh, the back of the room, we have staff back there uh, counting the ones that uh, we have not received earlier. And I should note, there's, there's other protocol, like they um, have to be written, submitted, not by email. Uh, have your APN, so there are other criteria for a valid protest. Okay. And so with that, I will um, move on to item three, board members' opportunity to remove items from consent agenda. Anything? All right. Any comments on on the consent agenda that's not at a level of removing. Well, I, ha I have a comment on the uh, management update. There's an item about um, a letter to the uh, Times Publishing Group talking about uh, how 
it's actually misinformation about uh, and taking a, a quote out of context um, about how the wa the groundwater basin is in in good shape. Um, and there'll be more on that later during the presentations. So with that, um, are there any motions for the consent agenda? I'll move approval of consent. Um, Tom and Jennifer, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? <clears throat> all right, and welcome Carla. Okay. Sorry about that, I was detained. Understand it. Um, so that brings us up to 7.1 because we're going to do item five, the, our own written communication and the reports later in the interest of time. Everybody, I'm sure, doesn't want to stay here too late. Um, and so 7.1 is conditional and unconditional will serves. There are none. Um, 7.2 we're gonna gonna put after 7.3. So 7.3 is conduct majority protest public hearing and consider adoption of ordinance 24-01, fixing rates, charges, and fees. So Ron. Yes, thank you, President Jaffe. And and our CFO Leslie Schrump's gonna kick it off tonight, and we have a little trilogy to help do the presentation. So this evening, we've brought a memo before the board um, to consider adopting um, rates, charges, and fees in accordance with Proposition 218. The rate study was performed by Raftelis Financial Consultants, and we do have a um, presentation here to go through um, for the benefit of our public members. We do have an agenda. Um, we've got some introductions of the team that's going to be presenting to you tonight. Um, we have a district overview and then a, a rate study, uh, an overview of the rate study itself, the public participation and outreach that we engaged in to try and get our customers participating in the process. We'll go over the proposed rates and then we will open um, the public hearing for public comment. So just brief introductions. I'll let you go to the next slide, slide please. Brief introductions this evening. Um, presenting to you tonight is going to be Melanie Mal Schumacher, our Special Operations um, Manager and our Assistant General Manager, as well as Kevin Kostick from fin uh, Raftelis Financial Consultants, who actually performed our rate study for us. And then, of course, I'll be presenting as well. I'm, I'm the uh, Finance and Business Services Manager. So I'll pass it off to Melanie. Thank you, Leslie. Good evening and welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to be taking a couple of the slides at the beginning before Kevin comes up. Really, it's a time for us, we feel, to provide a little bit of information and background related to who we are, what, what's important to us, and we hope what's important to you, and then, of course, why that's so important within our budget setting and the rate study. So again, Soquel Creek Water District, we are a not-for-profit special government agency created in the 1960s to provide water here to our community. Um, our goals are about water resource management and sustainability, infrastructure and delivery, community engagement and trust, fiscal responsibility, customer service and workforce, and organizational excellence. We are in the business of serving water, and most of our service areas in the Santa Cruz Mid-County area, we serve the communities of Aptos, La Selva Beach, Seascape, Soquel, and portions of Capitola. We are governed by a board of directors of five here today, and we are a staff of about 49 employees. Most of our infrastructure does rely heavily on providing groundwater to our customers. We have tanks wells, pump stations, pipelines, fire hydrants, water meters, and more. And really our main focus is to ensure that we can provide high quality drinking water to our customers 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year to meet the daily needs of cooking, washing, bathing, um, all the other essential needs, and of course, even recreation. Water is also very important in terms of providing 
It's used during uh, essential emergencies. Specifically, as you know, um, this area does have wildfires as well as small fires in our uh, urban areas. We also have emergency inner ties. I know tonight is a day where there's quite a bit of rain, um, but sometimes even surface water is not as reliable as groundwater. In fact, last year, we had to open up the inner tie to provide water to the city of Santa Cruz. And also, about a year ago, was when we made national news um, when our coastline was getting pummeled by the storms as well as the Bates Creek um, washout and that actually provided a, a disconnection of service to a small community in SoCal. Now I think we've done a pretty good job over the years of explaining that SoCal Creek 1 doesn't get water from the creek, we're 100% groundwater, but also the, the challenges that we have here in our area, which is uh, we are designated as a critically overdrafted ground basin by the state of California. So we are one of 21 basins, I'm sorry, we are one of 21 basins identified as critically overdrafted, and in California there are over 500 groundwater basins. So we have the designation and the requirement to bring the basin back into sustainability by 2040. Um, that is basically due to the seawater intrusion and contamination that has been occurring in the 1980s. And we are actively working with ourselves as well as, well as other community groups, including the city of Santa Cruz, the county of Santa Cruz, Central Water District, and private well owners. Um, that comprise the Mid-County Groundwater Agency to bring the basin back into sustainability. Now we have a great illustration of this on our website, which is actually animated, but this um, depicts what seawater intrusion is. In the Central Valley, they have a condition called subsidence, but here, because we have an ocean that's right next door to our groundwater basin. That ocean water can come in and actually contaminate and intrude into our freshwater resources. So over time, when more groundwater is extracted than what can naturally be replenished by rainfall, this condition of seawater intrusion and contamination occurs where that ocean water comes in and will either affect drinking waters that are drinking water wells that are nearby and or other private wells. This is a phenomenon that is occurring right here in our community. This is um, an illustration of the Monterey Bay. We are right here in this gold circle or oval and these yellow dots illustrate where we have detected through our monitoring wells active seawater intrusion where we have we take water quality levels and water quality samples and a sample you know is pulled once a month and some of these wells are actually detecting very brackish salty water none of our groundwater wells yet have been um, impacted by this and we really want to keep it that way as you can see as you go farther down into the Monterey Bay down in Watsonville and Moss Landing that seawater contamination is coming in around three miles you go farther down to Marina and Salinas and that's seven to ten miles so it's critically important we did a study um, in 2019 where we had this contraption which is right here on the cover of Aptos Times called SkyTem it's an aerial geophysical tool that could better detect and model the seawater contamination that's occurring at the coastline. And the results of this study um, concluded that it is right at literally the doorstep of our groundwater basin. So um, as Ron likes to call it, it was game on that we really needed to address this. Um, not only were, were we personally interested, as we have been for a long time, but now the state had come in and, and basically mandated that our region address this. So what does it mean when the state mandates this requirement? Um, I brought along this little handout. This is an eight-page kind of reader's digest to the groundwater sustainability plan, which is required uh, for all the critically overdrafted groundwater basins to prepare. And it's basically the guidebook of how we will achieve basin sustainability. And these are the requirements that we need to meet to address the local groundwater issues. I won't go into detail on them, but as you can see, there are five main uh, issues or drivers. Primarily, we're focused on tonight, the seawater intrusion and the chronic lowering of the groundwater levels 
but we also want to ensure that there's water stored in the groundwater basin for future use. Uh, we want to make sure that the water quality stays high and drinkable. And of course, we also want to make sure that we're monitoring the impacts to the surface water and groundwater um, interfaces. Now this eight page handout has some really great illustrations. I'm just gonna walk through a couple because again, what does it mean to be sustainable? So um, I'm gonna go ahead and describe the, uh, this graph here on the right. The Y axis is groundwater elevation. So we need to have protective groundwater elevations in our groundwater basin to ensure that ocean water is staying at bay. And Salt water is heavier than fresh water, so we want to have a positive outflow. So the basin sustainability indicator is that we want to have groundwater levels above 20 feet in this monitoring well that is being represented here. The x-axis is the years over time, so you can see from 2020 to 2060. So our groundwater modeling, we included different projects, programs, and activities that are being um, implemented here in our local basin. This first illustration right here, which is kind of like a light green line, as you can see, this includes the projects and activities such as water conservation, moving groundwater pumping away from the coast and more inland, and also installing new groundwater wells more inland so that we're extracting farther away from the coast. Those actions and activities are a cornerstone to the district as well as a lot of the other agencies here. It's kind of one of the main foundations of our community water plan. But as you can see, we've made a lot of strides. Um, before conservation and some of these other activities were implemented, groundwater levels were very low, even below sea level. And um, the report even says that we've made huge strides to increase groundwater levels and become more efficient, but it is not enough to fully recover the groundwater basin levels. You can see here, we still have quite a bit of a gap before we reach that red line of basin sustainability. So the green line, you would you want that line to be up toward the orange line or, or red. Okay, thank you. So the modeling also included projects and programs that we are implementing, such as pure water Soquel, aquifer storage and recovery, water transfers, and even stormwater capture. And you can see with the implementation of these projects and activities, just like what Ron was mentioning, we're getting closer and closer, and we are achieving that red line of sustainability. So, so that's kind of an illustration of, of the basin indicator there at that coastal monitoring well. And then going back to our illustration of, you know, what, what does that look like? You remember before there were these red arrows that were coming in to where the extraction wells, the, the drinking water wells are pulling water out. Pure water Soquel would be putting water into the groundwater basin. That purified water would create that positive outflow to create a seawater intrusion barrier. It will also help increase protective water levels so that that seawater intrusion doesn't start to move in. So I do have a couple of slides. As much as we try to share information about Pure Water Soquel, um, we do have quite a bit of information on our website. If you're not aware of that, I encourage you to go onto our website. But we are gonna just go through a couple of slides to uh, describe Pure Water Soquel. The project uh, was approved by the board and an environmental impact report was certified back in 2018. We'd actually been looking at recycled water since 2015 as a way to augment uh, and replenish our groundwater basin. But the picture on the left basically is our geographical overview of what Pure Water Soquel is. It's a recycled purified water project that would be taking secondary effluent that is currently being treated at this yellow star in Santa Cruz, that's the Santa Cruz Wastewater Treatment Plant. About six to eight million gallons a day goes out to the ocean. We would be capturing about 25% of that and putting that water to beneficial reuse by conveying it through Santa Cruz to the second middle yellow star, which is the Advanced Water Purification Center at Chanticleer. Um, and then we would take that water, 
purify it there, and then it would go out to the blue lines out towards Capitola and Aptos to our three seawater intrusion prevention wells. So I want to um, just kind of note that, you know, over the years the district has been um, really doing our best to try and raise money for the project um, by seeking grants and low interest loans. We have been um, pretty successful in that. We've received over $95 million in grants through the state and federal agencies. And then the remaining project has been funded through low interest loans. We've been in construction since 2021 and we are looking to bring the project online at the end of this year. But specifically, before I go to the next slide, and I just want to, I'm going to dive in a little bit into that, that yellow star in the middle. How many of you are uh, familiar with where that is? If you've seen the bike pedestrian bridge that's going on right there around Soquel Avenue, how many of you have seen that bridge? How many of you know that the water purification center is right there as well? Okay. So I'm going to show a couple pictures of that. So this is the Pure Water Soquel Water Purification Center. We broke ground in 2021. That's a picture on the right. Um, and it is comprised of, um, this is kind of where we like to say the magic is happening. This is where the water purification will take place in this building. We have some ancillary um, equipment and, and buildings here. We also will have our O&M Center here and a learning center where we would like to have tours. But uh, it's co-located right now with the bike pedestrian bridge. So this is that construction that you're also seeing um, that will kind of create right here in that live oak area um, alternative transportation and, and alternative water. So it's really exciting that as people are coming in and out of our community, they're able to witness and see some really innovative and I think um, true environmental stewardship happening on that property. Once the water is purified at that site, um, that pure water is going to go out to those three uh, red stars that you saw on the map. And those are seawater intrusion prevention wells. Those have been strategically located um, by our hydrologists to um, best put that purified water into the groundwater basin in areas where it would create the most benefit, both from um, raising protective water levels and creating that seawater intrusion barrier, but also uh, in front of very active production wells that the district um, operates. Now, the project has been in development since 2015, and we've been under the state mandate since 2014. Um, progress is continually measured, um, and that is something that our board does for our project. The state requires that as well. We do annual updates to the state related to the progress of our groundwater basin and the project activities. Um, every five years, we also have to do um, a report to the state there was some information that went out um, based upon a presentation that was done last month, and I just wanted to make sure and clarify that to you as we try to make sure that um, people are informed. The basin still has um, shot signs of being not, not sustainable yet, and the hydrologist for us, Georgina King, wrote a letter to us. She wanted to provide that to us to the Mid-County Groundwater Agency and also to the Regional Water Quality Control Board that we are still seeing undesirable results. We still are needing to achieve basin sustainability by 2040. We are making progress, but as you can see here, projects like Pure Water Soquel is still needed to eliminate those undesirable results. So I'd like to just share that with you. I know we, I've gotten a couple calls. So if you, if you hear information about the basin, um, you know, what's the status of the basin, this letter is available and in the packet. Um, two last slides before I turn it over to Kevin. But again, pulling up from some kind of, I, I dove deep into pure water Soquel, but really what are the benefits of a reliable and sustainable water supply? We did a study back in 2019. An economist and professor up at UCSC did a study for us about the, the economic benefits. And having a reliable water supply will provide nearly $1 billion dollars in economic benefits to our residences, the businesses here, and also the environment and our protection of our natural resources. 
the bottom part of it basically in a nutshell is if we didn't have a sustainable water supply, we would have less water and that water would cost about three times more than what it does now. Just a clarification. I, I, I thought I heard you say one million, but one, that's... One billion. One with a B. Okay, thank you. Isn't there a movie, One Billion Dollars? Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. And then, um, you know, I, I think one of the things that's kind of true to the district's mission and our values and our goals is about environmental stewardship and doing things in a sustainable and cost-effective way. I think a lot of things, too, as we are starting to shift, um, I, um, we had an open house a couple weeks ago, had some really great conversations from customers that came to that over at Temple Bethel. And I think um, one of the things that we're really trying to share with people is that being in conservation minded is holistic. I think in the years past, it's been a lot about using less and you know really restricting use. Um, state, the state has declared you know 25% less, but really holistically as we go forward and we really want to embrace more of an environmental conservation and sustainability mindset of not just using less, but also about ways that we can promote sustainability in many different ways. Um, I think the Pure Water Soak Help project is a conservation project because we are reusing and recycling. And so um, I, I am empowered and I feel that the community is understanding that as we go forward and we look forward to bringing that project online. And I think with that, I will switch it over to Kevin. And Kevin, just let me know when you want me to advance the slides. Will do, thank you, Melanie. Good evening, directors, staff, members of the public in attendance tonight. Uh, Kevin Kostick from RAFTELUS. We're going to do a recap of our work with the rate study. Next slide, please. So this slide showing our public meeting schedule with your board. Our work started well before. We started uh, late spring, early summer of last year. Uh, but we came to you first in October. We talked about the financial plan and preliminary results of the long term for, as far as revenues and expenses. Uh, we had an informational webinar in November with the community uh, just before Thanksgiving. We were back uh, a few days after that with uh, revised financial plan outlooks for you. We came back, we talked about rate structures, some alternatives. Uh, that was uh, a selection on December 5th. We returned with a firm proposal on December 19th and then noticed our customers January 4th. We held a second webinar with the community late in January. Uh, and then as Mel Melanie mentioned, we had an open house with the community about two weeks ago, about 10 days ago, uh, at Temple Bethel. And here we are tonight for uh, the, the end of the road for our rate study work, the public hearing itself. Uh, the process worked not just with the board, but with the rate study uh, advisory committee. Uh, it's an ad hoc committee, two board members with public participation. Uh, these folks started working on the rate study process back in April and worked through November of, of last year. We've got a couple screen grabs uh, and photos from uh, the public participation in those meetings. Next slide, please. My team met with the advisory committee at five different points. Uh, first in August to talk about uh, rate study process 218, which is the, the legal uh, structure we work through here in California as far as rate setting. Uh, we talked about financial planning in September. We talked about rate design and cost of service in October, and then uh, had feedback and input from the committee in October and November on actual rates, rate alternatives, and uh, preliminary and proposed rates. Next slide. So the board, the committee, but also uh, lots of outreach with the community. So I mentioned we had informational webinars, we had the open house, uh, we have bill inserts, social media posts, uh, contacts at the farmer's market. We have a dedicated website. Uh, the 218 notice itself to customers, um, I think was a fairly thorough uh, as far as the behind the rates and the story uh, behind why rate increases are necessary. And then the thing that's not on here is there's also a bill calculator online. So folks can go online, uh, put in their information as far as what kind of customer they are, what kind of meter size they have from their bill and their water use and calculate their current proposed bills. Next slide, please. 
So this just uh, summarizes the decision points and kind of the four key areas along the way for us. So first, our policy objectives. Uh, your board gave direction on your key priorities uh, before we came along uh, early in 2023. And those priorities were financial sustainability, social equitability, and legal defensibility. So those are kind of core foundational uh, objectives that guide our rate setting process. Then is the financial plan. So we look out over a 10 year horizon and we project what are the revenues of the district with the current rates and what are our projected expenses? So what are our operating costs? What are our capital reinvestment needs? What's our uh, debt service? So repayments on past borrowings and then what are our reserve contributions? Uh, we go through that 10 year look and the result is a 10% overall increase that's required in the first year and 12% in years two, three, and four of this four-year plan. The third piece is the cost of service analysis. So this is a technical analysis where uh, we look at all of our operating and our capital costs. Uh, we, we ask ourselves what purpose uh, or function does that cost serve on the water system and allocate them out to our different user groups. And so we use our existing cost service as a basis and, and update to reflect the most up-to-date uh, cost allocations and uh, user demands. And then the last piece are rate structure modifications. So we do have revisions proposed in this rate study, uh, revising the residential tiered structure from two tiers to three and increasing the amount of fixed revenue that comes from rates from 40% to approximately 60%. Next slide, please. So these are the kind of key takeaways, if uh, take away nothing else from the study. Uh, we have these future basin sustainability costs related to the pure water uh, SoCal project. And we differentiate those between the fraction that serves higher volume users and supplemental water supply to serve those customers and recover those the water use rates. Then we have the basin wide reliability benefit that's recovered over the fixed charges as a benefit to all parcels that are being served by the district. Fixed charges, again, recalibrated to recover more of the district's fixed costs. Uh, a three-tier rate structure, uh, which will uh, provide an intermediate tier. It lowers the threshold of tier one, as you'll see in a few slides, but it uh, includes now an intermediate tier. And so when we step through all those changes, the impacts to customers are going to depend on their customer class, the size of meter that serves their property, and their water use. Next slide, please. So we'll walk through a few different uh, bill impacts. These are all for single family customers, presumed uh, single family with a five eighths inch meter connection. So this example is for a household that uses five units of water per month. You could think of that as uh, say efficient indoor use for a household of two, perhaps three or winter water use. They would see an increase under this proposal of about a dollar a day, 98 cents per day. Next slide. That same 5 8 inch meter connection with nine units of water served in a month would see a decrease of almost $2 per day. So again, we could think of this as a higher volume user, but it could also be uh, summer needs for that same family with irrigation demands. It could be uh, efficient use for a household of say four or five. And then lastly, the middle ground, seven units a month. So this is kind of represented with somebody who may use uh, less water in the winter time, have irrigation needs in the summer or might be that roughly four person household, their bill sees no change. So within a dollar between the current and the proposed bill at seven units per month. Next slide, please. So talking about what drives the rates and the overall revenue needs, these are kind of the core uh, drivers. So first inflationary pressure, we talk a lot about inflation in the last year or two. That's true for utilities. In fact, if we talk about general inflation being at 3%, utilities are normally experiencing that at more like 6%. So it's, it's roughly double. We think about all the capital uh, infrastructure that we have and the specialized services and components and hard to reach areas and we experience increased inflationary pressure for utilities. Uh, supply sources and costs. So we talked about the Pure Water Program a project that does change the cost structure going forward. Cash reserves, which you've had to utilize in the past several years with declining per capita demands. Future borrowing terms and assumptions. So you do have a significant loan on the Pure Water project that comes online uh, kind of towards the end of this 10-year look. 
but those terms are very favorable with a deferred principal option, a very long-term repayment horizon, and an interest rate that's on the order of 1.3%. Talked a little bit about baseline water sales estimates. So we do continue to see uh, declining demands, and that puts pressure on our mostly fixed costs. So that puts pressure on rates. And then outside of all of the rest of that, you have your, your built system, all the utility infrastructure and pipes and pumps and tanks that serve your customers, and that needs continued uh, reinvestment. So again, putting all that together, projecting revenues, projecting expenses, and what's required is a 10% increase in, that, in the first year, so that would be March 1st of this year, uh, followed by 12% increases in January of 2025, 26, and 27. So we've talked, uh, I talked on a prior slide about basin sustainability. So talking about the benefits that Pure Water provides, uh, a change in this study is to look at the existing methodology, which is 20% to our uh, basin benefit, uh, basin-wide benefit, and that's recovering uh, what were the costs of, uh, or the district's share of costs of uh, the groundwater management agency. And the remainder uh, currently recovered from that tier two residential rate in the form of water reliability. The update shifts that to be a split of 55-45, looking at the seawater intrusion barrier benefit to all parcels served by the district, and then that remainder being the supplemental water supply provided to large volume users. So when we update this, what we're doing is making sure that large volume users pay their fair share of supplemental water costs, but also ensuring that those who benefit, every parcel benefiting from those current and future benefits of uh, having the project uh, preventing seawater intrusion are paying for that. The current, under the current structure, if you don't use water, if you're uh, out of town or if you're a part-time resident, you're basically getting uh, out of paying that fee. Going forward, having it be uh, part of the fixed charges, paying based on the size of your meter ensures that everyone's paying their fair share of the benefit received. So second uh, rate structure modification is the increase in fixed revenue recovery overall. So from 40% to 60%. And that's a combination of things. We've got an increased revenue need, that 10% in the first year and 12% thereafter. Uh, also recovering the basin-wide benefit costs of pure water uh, from fixed charges and uh, trying to uh, increase the overall share of the cost that we recover again because or predominantly fixed costs revenue, and one of the board priorities is financial sustainability. And then rate structure modifications, looking at the residential tier structure. Uh, what's proposed is to introduce that intermediate tier. So now tier one steps down from uh, a threshold of 5.0 to 5.99 units per month down to 3.99. So that's based on the average water uh, winter water use characteristics of single family users in SoCal Creek service area. And then an intermediate tier that uh, goes from four to about eight units per month. So again, providing for the peak summer needs, those irrigation needs uh, of single family class. And then all water use beyond tier two falls in that tier three, which would now start at eight units per month. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see a comparison so again, currently we have two tiers, that first tier up to uh, 5.99 units, and then stepping into tier two at six units per month uh, at a, a rate of $41.23. The proposed ratchets down tier one, uh, provides that intermediate tier now between four and eight, and then again, uh, a new tier three above eight units. So we'll step through uh, the, the rate schedules themselves. Uh, highlighted here is a five eighths inch row. That's typical of most of our single family residential users. So here we're showing our current rates and then proposed March of 2024 and then the three years thereafter. Uh, and you see the increase uh, in March 2024. Again, everything all in, the increase in the revenue needs, the uh, purposeful recovery of additional revenue from fixed uh, meter charges, and then again, uh, the basin-wide benefit of pure water being recovered in the fixed charge. 
And then he, your district differentiates fixed charges by customer class. So uh, the prior was for single family, multifamily, and commercial users. Here's a schedule for irrigation users. Uh, same charge, uh, same components, but again, differentiated based on their demand patterns and how they how this customer class uses water. They peak more than those other classes and their charges are reflected here. Next slide. Uh, water use rates, we stepped through the single family and the, uh, the slides prior. We'll look at those again here. Again, just the, the four-year outlook, current and four-year proposed, and then uniform rates for our commercial class and irrigation class. Those are uniform rates, but differentiated for both. Uh, a decrease in those rates, because again, it's a uniform rate. We're recovering more on the fixed charges. It's reflected in their fixed charges. But what that means is the water use of the commodity rate does come down in the first year before it then increases in years two, three, and four. And last but not least, uh, water shortage emergency rates. So these are uh, supplemental and temporary rates that are at your discretion if there's a declared shortage or a water shortage emergency. Um, kind of a, an additional tool in the toolbox should you require that in the future, but not proposed to be implemented uh, with this increase. Or at this time, I should say, available for, for the future. And with that, I will turn it back to Leslie. Okay, so now we're back to the public hearing component of this. And for um, those in our audience who aren't familiar with the uh, procedures of a public hearing, um, the Board of Directors will open the public hearing. We'll invite everybody to uh, make public comment if they wish to do so. Then we will um, want to call for additional written of protests. If anybody has a written protest that they have not handed in yet and want to do so, we encourage you to get that done. Um, they're waiting at the back table for any protests that might come in. And then the Board will close a public hearing and then make a deliberation on the motions. Thank you, Leslie. Just so we know how many people would like to speak tonight, could I see that with a show of hands? Okay. Our typical um, time we allow for public comment is two minutes. I think with the number of people that have raised their hands, it's doable for everybody to speak. Um, and we do want to hear from you. Uh, some guidelines. Uh, no uh, clapping, no yelling, um, no swearing for some people, not my kids. But the, um, and if you agree with somebody and want us to know about that, please just raise your hand. And uh, I'm going to be very strict on the two minutes. And there's no seating of your, your additional time to another speaker. We want to hear from what, what you think of things. So with that. And President Jaffe, if I may make another recommendation, uh, just trying to honor your own, your time and those of those around you. If you want to speak and you see the lines down to like two people, maybe you could come up and be next in line just so the flow keeps going. That'll help facilitate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. All right, so who would like to speak first? Good evening, Michael. Oh. <laughs> Is that mic on? Hello? Okay. Can you hear me okay? Hi, I'm Mike Boyd. I live at 5439 SoCal Drive, SoCal, California. I did submit a, a protest on the 13th. I brought an extra copy in case you need it. Um, I'm protesting the, the rate increase. Um, basically back in 2015, I sued the district over uh, their tiered rates and uh, them giving five million bucks to city of Santa Cruz for studying DSAL. Uh, I wanted the appeals court on the tiered rates 
and I settled with the district for five thousand dollars. And the district basically assured me that they were going to they were going to stick till the two tiers and then get get rid of the tiers after they raise the rates the next time. Um, that's not what happened, unfortunately. And uh, now I'm seeing you got three tiers. My understanding is those uh, tiers are based on how much it costs to to get the water that you produce from the ground, and then have, and then there's some that's going for the the uh, the um, pure water, SoCal. The problem is you can't charge me for water from pure water SoCal because you're not producing water. Okay, so it's not constitutional, and and the forty one cents that you charged. That's not constitutional either. Okay, and if so, what I have to do is I have to sue you again. And when I sue, I'm going to sue you over the tiered rates and I'm going to sue you over the 41 cents because you, if you increase the rates, it's presumed under Prop 26 that it's a, a tax unless there's a vote first. Thank you. Thank you for respecting the time, Mike. Uh, do we have somebody else? I I see some hands. Thank you. Am I supposed to raise my hand? No, John. <laughs> Hi. Uh, you all know me real well. My name is John Cole. I'm also a rate payer. And I want to reiterate something that Mike brought up. Okay. Your consultant didn't really go into detail how they devised these rates, including the revenue requirement for the rate setting year 2024. 2024 was the rate setting year and um, based on that revenue requirement, usually typically based on the budget of the operating, operating expenses plus capital expenses minus some adjustments, that's driven all the way down into the duration of the rates. And what they put in there was $5.5 million. I want you to remember that number, $5.5 million or PWS O&M cost. Well, just like Mike says, PWS doesn't exist. It won't be exist until maybe September. So between now and September, March to August, you're talking about $2.74 million of revenue that you're gonna obtain that you're not incurring a cost for. And so you need to justify that. You need to understand how that rate study was put together, and they shouldn't have put this PWS cost in there now. It's, it, you should actually have another rate study in September, in October, November, where you can now put that in there. You, you can't do it. I'm sorry. Thank you, John. I'm seeing hands going up. Hi, my name is Maria Marsilio, and I have a property at 7227 Mesa Drive in Aptos. Um, question for the board. Uh, you say that you have $95 million in grants for the Pure Water Project. How much is the total of that project going to cost now? I know a few years ago in 2018, it was $130 million. I'm sure it's gone up, so I have a question about that. Um, and then also, I, I, um, I did the math on um, Kevin's rates there. And uh, we start at $70.45 for two units as a current bill. And the 10% rate would be $78.08. And then on top of that in 2025, a 12% would be 87.40. However, I went on your website just now and put in the uh, $70.54 and with two units, and it comes out to $98.76. So that's over a 40% increase, not just 10 and 12. That's very concerning. Those, those numbers just don't add up. Um, so these. Please, oh, we don't want to be interactive here. We want to hear what people have to say. 
So please keep your comments to yourself. If you want to speak at the, the podium, you can. I, I work um, with a population of people who are um, at risk, um, senior citizens, and as well as others. As well as others. So I, I implore you to really be respectful of them because this kind of an increase is going to severely impact people like that who are on a fixed income. It's really difficult for them to afford to live here. And this is a necessity. Water is a necessity, and I understand. But it, it's really hard for people. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Next. Chris. Hi, I'm Chris Kirby. I live in um, the Seascape area. We've been talking to a lot of ratepayers, and it's been very interesting. Only about three out of 100 people think that Soquel Creek is doing the right thing. The rest could not sign the protest fast enough. You're hurting people financially, and how does that feel? People cannot afford to take a daily shower or plant a vegetable garden. We just went through five years of a 54% increase, and now you're demanding more, and how dare you all do that to us? You're making people's lives unaffordable, although, and that's the big buzzword, affordable housing, affordable. This is unaffordable. All the while, you're giving bonuses to employees for doing their regular jobs. Bonuses, bonuses should be given at the end of a project if it comes on in under the projected cost and before the time it was due, not retroactively and every month. This needs to stop and stop now and be responsible with our money. Starting a project that was originally estimated at $60 million and now the cost is $200 million and could be going up it's, is irresponsible and obviously poorly managed. We did not ask for Pure Water Soquel. You forced us into this project. Why aren't other local water districts helping pay for it since they're also going to get water from it? The district needs to manage their costs and not keep asking us to pay more and more. Hookup fees in 2007 were 12 dollars and 30 cents for a regular 5 8 inch hookup and now they're going to be 80 dollars and 44 cents and more in three years and that's not the cost of inflation one local retired physician signed the protest and i asked him what he thought about the pure water socal project he said that none of us should drink the water he's worried about cancer rates going sky high at every board meeting i see you each with your water bottles and i'm guessing that none of you that water is not straight from the tap, probably through a filter. And what does that say to us? It'll soon be recycled wastewater, and does that does not sound appealing or safe? Stop this increase. Thank you, Chris. I see some hands raised, and I saw them at different points during what Chris talked about as well. Um, good evening, Jerry McMullen. I uh, live at 3410 South Polo Drive in Aptos, and... Uh, I, um, I want to echo many things that have been said already. I've um, been working 25 years in social services, and I see firsthand the effects of uh, the increased cost uh, to live here in this county and the toll it's taken on people's mental health and contributing to all kinds of things, including uh, reckless behaviors and, and so on. Um, I wanted to find out about the study because I didn't hear anything mentioned about um, uh, the history of saltwater intrusion and how that has affected uh, where we are today and what was, you know, determined, uh, was that even considered in terms of rates? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and, you know, I believe poor planning is, has a lot to do with that in terms of I don't, I'm not aware any reservoirs that have been built in the past that were able to capture, have been able to capture water and carry us through times that are, are uh, drier and uh, not as abundant. Um, and so I'm also curious about that study, and I, I can pour over it, but I'm wondering if that was uh, considered as well as um, who should pay for the poor decision making that was done many, many years ago. I don't think it should be the, the, the rate. Uh, the, the homeowners or the rate, uh, water, the people that are paying for the, the rates you're indicating. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see some hands agreeing with that. Uh, could you, 
as Ron suggested, if you know you're going to want to talk, uh, we can decrease the amount of change over time if, if you line up ahead of time. Good evening. My name is Antonia Stoney. I live at 113 Madeline Drive in Aptos. And um, I just have a couple questions. Um, I want to echo what the, the lady said earlier. Um, I don't understand why the, um, the households that use the least amount of water are going to get hit the hardest. It just doesn't make sense to me. And I think there was a comment made something about, oh, yeah, well, those we've got to get those people who you know, are out-of-towners, you know, they're in the same category as the people who use the least amount of water. Something is wrong there because um, I was brought up to always conserve water. And a policy that doesn't respect the idea that water is a, a valuable resource that we must all conserve does not make sense to me. It, it, does ha it doesn't have legs. I'm sorry. It just, it's not working. Um, the other thing that strikes me is that the, the biggest users are getting, are getting actually a rate decrease or, or staying the same. I, I just, I want you to reconsider who you're impacting here. It's very expensive to live here. People make big sacrifices, and they're willing to make big sacrifices over their water, too, to, to keep the expenses down. We, we know that you, we, you know, we want to support you. We, we need water. Um, but, but please be mindful. Thank you. Thank you. I see hands raised. Becky? Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I've been assisting with collecting protests because you know what? Your rate payers didn't know they could. They didn't know they could protest. I listened to the, the uh, online uh, rate study thing, and never once was staff saying people have a right to protest. I ask you to take no action tonight. That is your option number four by staff. You can take no action. I ask you to reconsider, given what you've heard, given the number of protests, which I would wager is a, a record number for anything you've ever done, and uh, reconsider this. It bothers me that um, you continue to give staff $1,600 a month bonuses, $1,000 a month bonuses, and come and, and penalize those who have worked the hardest to conserve. It makes no sense, as the former speaker said, and also what Darcy Pruitt said in the Santa Cruz Sentinel. She wrote the Mid-County Groundwater Sustainability Plan. It doesn't make sense to her either. I think um, you need to clarify that uh, Ms. Georgina King did say to the Mid-County Groundwater Board, the basin is doing pretty well. I was there. Your staff was not. So for them to criticize and call it misinformation, I'm quite offended. The district has had to reconvene their, uh, redo their, their use for this because people conserve so much. Leslie Strom said in the initial hearings, we're here because we're at $11 million shortfall because people have conserved so much. That's never shown in here. Neither is it explained the $5.5 million increase uh, for operating costs for Pure Water SoCal. There's never been any explanation about how paying, not paying your CalPERS debt to lower it to 10% will affect the rate payers either. Thank you, Becky. I'm seeing hands raised as well. Anybody else? My name is Michael Gutierrez. I live at 507 Pine Street in Aptos. And I can really relate to the folks that had a chance to speak. I've been on the right advisory committee, volunteer. I'm a senior with cancer on a fixed income. Having said that, I only saw one of the people, not to put people down, I only saw one person, Michael, at the open house where they talked about protests and so forth, but not one of the speakers spoke tonight. I was in the Sentinel. They wrote me up, and because he asked how I felt, and I initially went in, back when the rate advisory committee started, 
I didn't like the price increase. I didn't like the rate increase. Once again, we can't live without water. I will drink with cancer. I will drink with PWS. I will drink the water. That's not the point. The point is I changed as I went through the rate study and listened to sustainability. We need sustainability, stability, and equity. I'm paying for it. I didn't want to pay for it. It's expensive for me. I'm on a fixed income. The fact of the matter is, I look at this paying forward for future generation. I just found out today, I'm going to be a grandfather for the second time. The fact of the matter is, I'm willing to pay forward for our water for future generations. And I won't be around in 2040 for the sustainability that we've got to maximize. I won't be around. I will be here for the eclipse, April 8th, and the next one's 2040. I hope we don't eclipse our sustainability for our water here. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I see a hand raised. All right. Anybody else? Okay. Is there a motion to close? To close the public hearing. So moved. The question is whether I asked for written protest. I did at the beginning of, of the meeting, saying at the end of the closed, at, at the public comment period, was the, the limit on written protest. So, um, and I think it was also asked several other times. Is that correct, Josh? That's correct, President Jaffe, but if anyone has a written protest who hasn't submitted it, um, now's the time. Okay. Thank you. Now I'll move to close the public hearing. Looks like everybody got a chance or wanted to. There's been a motion. Is there a second? Second. <clears throat> second. Tom, um, Rochelle. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So. You want to start off, Tom? Yeah, a couple of things. I mean, I really understand frustrations on seeing the rates go up at the at the rate they are. <laughs> um, none of us really want that. But as Michael said, our number one thing is to have sustainability for future generations, his grandchildren, my grandchildren. And unfortunately, you know, we've looked at a lot of options. We did look at reservoirs. We did look at desal. And this is the best project by far. And it was funded much more by grants than we ever had hoped that. Yeah, the costs went up. And inflation sucks. But that's just what happened. So I think none of us like it. And then we're faced with wanting to take care of our groundwater basin. So we have to be able to pay for that. And one of the things I wanted to see in these rates is to have it be fair. One of the things that bothered me in the previous rates is that a family of four would just necessarily bump into a really high tier. And so this takes care of that. I mean, everybody is paying more on that service charge to pay for basin sustainability. And, you know, whether I, I didn't want it to go up quite as fast as it did, but, but I still I went along with it because I think our fixed costs are like 95% of, of what the district actually has to pay. So 60% fixed costs is really, you know, just bringing it closer in line. Um, and there's still a conservation signal. There's still an encouragement for people to save water because you're still going to save money if you don't overuse. So... The other thing I just wanted to mention is just these rates that we set, they are our maximum. If a year from now we look and, you know, there's been more water used than we expected or more people have built ADUs and things like that and we don't need to raise them as much as, predict as the maximum, then we won't. We'll look at it every year. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. We, we, have, that, we have that ability to analyze that every year. So, um, and it may not happen. I'm just saying, 
you know, we don't want it to go up any more than we have to to pay for our costs, maintain sustainability, and to be able to serve all the customers with water every day of the year with that reliable source of clean, fresh water. So that's all. Thank you, Tom. Any other directors? Yes. Jennifer? I just wanted to let you know that um, we're all in the same boat. We are all rate payers. I work for a living. I have to have fresh vegetables and fruits um, given to me by friends to make it to the end of the week. Um, I'm in the lowest user group, and I will be bearing the brunt of this. So I am you. We are together. Just wanted to make that clear. Any other comments from directors? Well, I, I just wanted to say that, you know, we've been looking for a project. Uh, we've been aware of seawater intrusion. It's been an, exis an existential uh, threat to our water supply. We've known about that for 30, 40 years. Uh, all of us, I've been here 30 years, all of us have been living here, but we did not pay and we did not solve that, pro that problem. There weren't any good projects. Reservoirs are very attractive, but they are not a great project. Uh, they're expensive with climate change, evaporation. There's a lot of issues that make it a very expensive approach to saving, saving, up wa saving water. Luckily, our customers, and I'm one of those too, I learned to conserve. I've been hauling water. I just, you know, there are wonderful, blissful winter that we had. I, I've stopped having to carry and conserve water as much as I did, taking showers more often. I, I've heard it all from all of you as I canvassed for re-election. Uh, so I get that. I get what you're saying, and I've, I took note of all of the things that people said tonight too, and I reflect those, I agree with that, but we help create the problem. We have to solve this problem together. We've been working really hard to get the Pure Water SoCal online, and it is in permitting now. We're getting, we're, that is gonna go online, and so with these costs, these tiers are to address when that goes online. And I feel like far from being mismanaged, the staff has done an amazing, an amazing job of struggling through COVID, a COVID pandemic, and the and Ukraine war that caused an incredible inflation of all the parts that needed to go into this project. We've done an amazing, the staff has done an amazing job of keeping this together and keeping it on track so that it's, what, I've been here 10 years that's pretty small amount of time for a project to go from research to completion. So it's really, I think, next time you see a staff member walking the streets, thank them. Thank them sometime. You know, they, everybody just stayed in there. We had COVID here all over the place. We, are, we had to be careful. We had to quarantine people, and we still kept the water flowing. So just... Really, uh, listen carefully, try to understand the, the factors that go into rates are very complex, and we'll all be disagreeing about one or the other aspect of it, but if you really listen to what we had to do, what our rate consultant did, he's certified by the state, this is a serious, a serious effort that has to be made to raise the rates. We're not capricious, we don't pick numbers out of the sky to just start charging people. We're all customers. So please listen, try to really understand what goes into the rates. And uh, the next time there's a rate advisory committee, I urge you to participate. This is the process that we went through now, and I really think you should study it hard and not just listen to, I've been saving water, and now they're charging me more. Yes, that's what happens when... We don't use as much water. We still have to provide the same level of service. Uh, and so that cost is divided among a smaller amount of money. Uh, and so we, we had to provide the water. 
So we did have to borrow that money that we didn't realize in revenues. So it is there. We lost that money or we didn't experience that money. But we are, I think we're on a good path to recover from that. Thank you. Rochelle? I think they all um, covered everything that I would possibly cover. Um, I think the, the big thing for most of us, most human beings, is that we want simple solutions. And simple solutions aren't going to fix this. And so we've had to work really hard to come up with what we've come up with. It, we didn't, like she said, we weren't capricious. Um, there was a lot of thought. And I think like our heart and souls went into this to try to figure out the best way. And, um, you know, fair is not necessarily a, a defined word. What's fair to one person isn't to another, but that doesn't mean that you're not being fair. Okay. Well, can I just make one? Yeah, go ahead. Just, I wanted to just, once again, make it really clear that when the consultant hydrogeologist was speaking to the Mid-County Groundwater Agency and said that we're doing well. She meant, and she clearly stated again, that we're doing well in moving towards the goal of sustainability by 2040 because the groundwater sustainability plan includes pure water Soquel, which will replenish the groundwater. It's not there yet, but that's what she was referring to. Okay, well, I agree with what's been said by the audience and also by the directors. I'm a, I'm a rate payer um, and my water use is towards the, the low end of things. My rates are going to go up. And I think Michael Gutierrez said, it. This, is, this is an investment in the future. Um, I'm willing to do that, and it's not it, it's not something that that I'm happy doing. Really, not happy doing it. Um, I'm going to close with. I was very impressed by a, a general manager of the Calaveras County uh, Water District, and this is almost verbatim, but it's, it's very close. And here's the, the quote that, that he, he sent out with his Prop 218. And it's, there's no sugarcoating this. The proposed rate increases are significant. If there was a better alternative, the water district would pursue it. But underfunding the water district would ultimately cost our communities more than these proposed rate increases. We need a generational investment in our water in the infrastructure, and we ask for your understanding. That summarizes my feelings as well about and thoughts about this. So, Josh, we need to have a, a, a report out on the, the protests. We do, and if I may, um, before we get, get to that, I, I, I heard two themes that I think need to be addressed. One is the, the low income. I'm not sure we, how do people are struggling, what are we doing? And so I'll ask Leslie to address that a little bit, just that one thing. And then the other one is because Prop 218 is kind of arcane for most people. Uh, I look to Josh Nelson to provide a little context around that, how it does. Um, what hey, it thank you, Ron. Sure. Leslie? Okay, so in terms of trying to assist our customers with, with their water bills and with water rates, we have applied twice now to the state arrearage program to get funds for our customers who fell behind on their bills during the pandemic. And then the state gives us those funds to apply directly to customer accounts. So we did receive almost $100,000 for customers a couple of years ago, and we have reapplied and are waiting to hear on another dispensation on that. We also have enrolled in the state's low house or low income household water assistance program which we call LIWAP. It's the equivalent of the PG&E light or the energy LIHEAP program, but it's for water. 
And we encourage any low-income household to apply. They can get a one-time assistance with their water bill um, in, in the hundreds or thousands of dollars, depending on how much water they use. So if you are a low-income household, we encourage you to apply. This program is due to sunset at the end of March. We have high hopes that the state will continue it if they get some federal funding for the program. We have also written um, letters to our legislators asking them to um, appeal to the federal government and to the state government to come up with some low-income assistance programs that we can participate in. As a special district who um, has to comply with the auspices of, of Proposition 218, we are not able to provide an in-house low-income assistance program because Proposition 218 prohibits you from taking the monies paid um, by ratepayers and using that to subsidize another class of customers. It's to protect um, it's, pro it's to protect constituents from being overtaxed and having that money go to the benefit of another uh, taxpayer. So it's actually a protection under Prop 218, but it does kind of hold our hands and, and keep us from being able to provide that in-house. So we will participate in whatever program we can at the state or federal level to help, help our customers with bills. Thank you, Leslie. Yeah, Josh, please. Um, I think so. As was mentioned, um, procedurally, uh, the proceeding this evening is subject to Proposition 218, uh, which means that there are some special procedural rules we need to move forward before the board can decide whether to uh, adopt the proposed rates. Um, and specifically, under the Proposition 218, water rates are what's called a property related fee, um, which means that before there's any increase in a property related fee, the district has to provide 45 day notice of the protest hearing that we just had, um, which provides an opportunity for any customer or property owner to submit a written protest against the, uh, um, the proposed adjustment. Um, if the district receives protests from 50% plus one of affected parcels by either the customer or the owner, the district cannot move forward. If the threshold uh, protest, the protest threshold or protest amount is below that threshold, excuse me, um, then the board can move forward with the proposed adjustment. Um, so with that background, I would turn it over to Ms. Western to announce the results of the majority protest hearing. Hi. So we have received 569 protests. These have not all been validated, but we are still below the majority protest threshold of 7,127. The board may move forward to consider adopting the ordinance. Thank you, Emma. And thank you, Josh, for explaining. So that brings us to whether there's any motions or not on this, unless there are other comments the directors want to make. Seeing none. Is there any does anyone want to make a note? I'll go ahead and make the motion to adopt the ordinance, fix the rate, you know, ordinance 2401. Second. So Tom and Carla. All right, and this probably has to be done by roll call, correct? I believe so. Director Balboni? Yes. Vice President Lather? Yes. Director LeHue? Yes. Director Christensen? Yes. And President Jaffe? Yes. So that concludes this item. I've rearranged this, this, the schedule. So we're now going to go back to item 7.2. Consider approval of contract amendment for professional legal and litigation services related Pure Water SoCal program. And who's taking this?
Is this you, Melanie? Yes, this is my item. <clears throat> So the item before you, um, item 7.2, is to consider approval of a contract amendment for professional legal and litigation services for the Pure Water SoCal program. As you know, the project has um, undergone some litigation towards the project due to um, environmental review. Um, recently, we've had five lawsuits filed on the project, all the same person, a pro per litigant. Um, several of these have been tried all the way up um, and, and have been completed. However, we did recently um, have a case that went to the trial court and to the appeal court, and the ruling was in the district's favor. Um, however, the litigant has voiced that she intends to, again, challenge that at the state level. And so before the item tonight, is for additional litigation services with BBK, who has been our um, consulting attorney to provide legal services. Currently, um, we don't see that this is something that would be um, received at the appeal level when it's challenged. So there are two options that are before us. Option one is for additional funding um, between 50 and $70,000. The second option would be if the California Supreme Court did grant a further review of the case, then the budget would need to be increased, and that estimate amount is about one hundred and fifty to one hundred and seventy thousand dollars. We think at this time we don't necessarily need to go to the option two, so we are asking the board to consider option one, which would be to fund it at the the lesser level. This. Um, Unfortunately, it's not a planned expense for the district, so we do need approval to come out of our operating contingency reserves. So we have two uh, considerations. One is to amend our existing contract with BBK, and the other is to reallocate funds from our OCR um, into uh, a, a pool of money that we can then use for this um, item. Thank you, Melanie. Is there any public, any questions by the board or any public comment? Public comment first. Thank you. My name is Becky Steinbrunner. I am the pro per litigant that has been challenging this because it's the only way that anyone can challenge a bad project <laughs> for environmental violations, and there have been many. Um, I made a copy of the uh, the case 21CV02699 that uh, recently was ruled upon by the uh, 6th District Court of Appeal. I'd like to enter that into the record so that your ratepayers could see what it is that this is all about. Now, it doesn't have to go to court. <laughs> I've been saying I would be willing to sit down and, at a table and talk with you, and I've been saying that all along, and you ignore me. So I have to take it to court, because you leave me no other choice. And I care about the environment. I care that this district has never gone to California Department of Fish and Wildlife to consult with them, as you are required to do by law, to get some meaningful and enforceable mitigations for this project. I have confirmed that with Wesley Stokes, the regional director of California Department of Fish and Wildlife. They have known nothing about your project until I let them know. Now, yes, you did send it to the clearinghouse, but by law, you are required to work with them to develop the mitigations, and you did not do that. And until March of, of uh, just last year, you had not submitted an anti-degradation, a final anti-degradation analysis. Now that is, uh, is on the books, and it shows that the aquifer will be degraded by the injection of the treated sewage water. It will be degraded. Now how can you say that that's okay? I don't understand, because you're not the only people using this water. There are private well owners, private water companies. Thank you. I'm submitting this for the record. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions by board members or comments? 
I guess I think it's okay to point out that the litigant has cost the district over $1.2 million, and that adds up to over $85 a person. Let's not be interactive here. You had your chance. You had your time. Any other comments by directors or questions? Seeing as that there's still lawsuits that are potential, I'm not going to get into disputing any of the facts. Um, but I want to point out, Becky, that I've met with you and at the farm bakery twice. And frankly, I found that it wasn't productive for either one of us. So I'm willing to meet with you. I'm willing to meet with you in the future, Becky, if we have, if we have a, a, a um, potential for productive conversations. So are there any, is any informational or no, we need to make, I'll make them both motions. Okay. So that's the, to, to amend the contract and to fund it from I'll, CR operating. I'll second both motions. Okay. This one, I think we can do a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Passes. Okay. So with the way things have been moved around, I have to go back to my notes here. Um, so, District Council, are there reports? Thanks, President Jaffe. In the interest of time, no verbal report for me this evening. Thank you. All right, thank you. And then the last item that's been moved around before closed session is oral and written communications. This is an opportunity for public members to speak on any item of interest that is not on the agenda. And President Jaffe, we also have item 7.4. Oh, excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks for the reminder. Didn't write that down. Yes, yeah, 7.4. Let's take 7.4 before oral comment. We have Shelley Flock, our water resources manager here, to present this item. That's why you were walking up there, Shelly. <laughs> Draft Ordinance 2204. It amends and repeals Ordinance 2203, which is establishing the rules and uh, regulations for water service from the district. There are two primary changes proposed to Section 4 on new service and modifications of existing services. That includes addition of language to exclude tiny homes on wheels from our requirement of separate or individual metering, and also addition of language to add that all single-family properties with additional dwelling units that are being served by a single meter can request a voluntary separation of service without having to pay water capacity if they can prove that capacity fees were previously paid or the dwelling existed and was legally recognized at the time of connection to the district. Regarding the tiny homes related changes, staff presented an analysis to the board um, on several occasions um, regarding requiring all new individual residential and non-residential units to be supplied with separate water services and meters. That was done in October and again in January at the January 16th meeting. At the January meeting, um, the board directed staff to remove the separate metering requirement from Ordinance 2203 for tiny homes on wheels only. All other residential units, including ADUs, accessory dwelling units, still have to be separately metered. So as related to tiny homes, we've uh, added proposed language to Ordinance 2203 to allow for this change, that's shown in um, attachment one, article two, uh, section 4E1, or page six of uh, the ordinance, and also in article two, section 4C. 
We also added a definition of tiny homes on wheels um, to that uh, article two, section one. Regarding the water capacity fees for existing dwelling units voluntarily requesting separation of service, we recently realized that the ordinance um, only allows that duplexes and triplexes, provided they were constructed before August 20th, uh, 20, 2002, when our separate metering requirement went into effect, do not have to pay water capacity fees when separating service. It doesn't currently allow the same treatment um, towards single family properties with other legal residential dwelling configurations such as granny units and ADUs. Um, that can show that they paid water capacity fees outright for multiple units at that time or came onto the district system at a time when those fees would have been collected. So the changes that we're proposing to the ordinance in Article 2 um, section 4F1, allow for equal treatment of those properties um, similar to duplexes and triplexes. As it might not be possible for um, applicants to locate proof of payment for water capacity fees after many years have passed, um, it suggested that another condition of the fee exemption um, is to allow the applicant to provide proof that the accessory structure was existing prior to connection to the district and that it was considered a secondary unit by the applicable land use agency, the County of Santa Cruz or the City of Capitola. Applicants that are um, voluntarily requesting this separation would still be responsible for all other new service fees, including the cost of installing the new service, in addition to the service and the water qu uh, quantity charges um, that happen monthly. Due to the construction costs associated with installing a new service voluntarily, um, as well as ongoing service charges uh, for each meter, we don't expect that this change will apply to very many applicants, but we did recently have uh, somebody in this situation that really wanted to separately meter. Um, and with that, the, the motions tonight are to um, consider the proposed changes to 2203 and adopt ordinance 2402 um, or take no action. All right, public comment. Thank you, Becky Steinbrenner. Um, I just want to make it clear that I hope the district will continue to um, apply the, these ordinances equally to all applicants. In the past, I was aware that Barry Swenson Builder got a lot of favors, and I was happy that you did not extend those to this phase two of the Aptos Village project. But um, it set a precedent, and um, you, you likewise granted favors to the um, Rancho Del Mar complex when they were remodeling. So again, I want to urge fairness here, no favors, and apply the ordinance equally to any and all who apply. Thank you. Any other public comments? All right. I'll move approval of the ordinance 20402 and repeal of 2203. Second. Tom and Jennifer, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Passes. Um, okay, so now that brings us to oral and written communications for items not on tonight's agenda. Thank you again, Becky Steinbrenner. Um, I was disappointed that the water optimization plan was not on your board's um, agenda February 6th, as it had been scheduled, and I see it has been moved to your early March meeting, and I hope that it does come forward. It's going to be a very interesting report uh, talking about how to use the Pure Water SoCal in conjunction with the uh, San Cruz City's ASR to benefit, best benefit the um, the aquifers. So I I hope that your district will request 
water from the city of Santa Cruz through the water transfers. You've done all the studies to show that there would be no problem mixing surface water with the groundwater. And um, you did, did do that transfer for a very short time, one year, I believe. And so now as we're getting this rain, um, maybe the conditions will occur such that you can ask the city of Santa Cruz to uh, buy water from them and not pump from your own um, areas and let the groundwater levels rise passively, and they will. So last winter, I was told that the district did not even ask. We had a good winter last year, but you didn't even ask. So this winter, if water starts spilling over the, the, the dam, I really hope you will ask. I go to the city of Santa Cruz water commission meetings and find them very interesting. And um, I would ask that or, or encourage you to look at some of their recent, uh, their last meeting was very, very interesting, a palette of all of the capital improvement projects that they are doing that will um, enable them, the city of Santa Cruz, to take more water from the river when it is plentiful and to use that water to store it in the, in the aquifer and aquifer storage recovery. It could also be available for the district. So um, what bothers me about the Pure Water SoCal project is that zero right now is gonna go for irrigation. Zero of the recycled water for irrigation, and that's what it should be used. Not even the 50 years of free water to the Twin Lakes Church is part of the permit that the Central Coast Regional Water Quality Board approved that is under, under consideration now. So why not? So please ask the city um, if, if there is water available and go that route. It's a lot less energy intensive. And I ask for that to happen, please. Thank you. Mike. Hello, Mike Boyd again. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the 41 cents and... Uh, I'm sorry, this is that was an item on the agenda tonight. Uh, no, that's last rate. I'm not talking about the current rates or the ones you just approved. I'm talking about the rates you approved before after you told me you weren't going to do it. That's not on the agenda, is it? You're correct. Go ahead. Thank you. So the the issue here is, uh, so I went to the, uh, I, I sued the, uh, the Central Coast Community Energy when they kept jacking the rates up. And, uh, and, I, and I lost in the trial court, like when I, when I sued you guys, and then I went to the appeals court. Now, they were, they, uh, what I was suing them over, as I said, two things. I was suing them because I, because I said they were raising the rates and, and, and we couldn't protest under their, their process. And, and I said that they, they were doing that without a vote of the people, so it was a tax. And then I also said that the, it was a tax because it, it, it wasn't reasonably related to the cost of the, the electricity service I was getting. So the appeals court did, agreed with the trial court on the, on the on the rates being reasonable, based on the fact that they were using PG and E's rates as a, a benchmark for their for their rates, but they disagreed prior to that, and that still stands over the fact that it was a tax. It is a, presumably a tax. That's what they ruled in the case with Boyd versus Central Coast Community Energy. So what that show was they were saying was a, under Prop Twenty Six. 2010, if you raise the rate, if you lower the rate, it doesn't apply. But And if it's reasonably related to the cost of the service, like, for example, getting water, um, then, 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 then it's exempt from that. Okay, But if it's not reasonably related to, it's presumed a tax. And that's what I'm going to argue on the 41 cents. See, I don't have to file a protest to sue you. 
I do have to do it to, um, I, I do have to do a protest if I, we're going for the 50% plus one, but it doesn't apply to the lawsuit. Last time I sued you, I filed a protest too, but I could go to court and I went to the appeals court. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about. You're raising, you can't raise the rates unless we have a vote. And, and it's just called a special tax and it requires a two thirds vote. Thank you. Thank you. All right, no other oral communications board members? It's been a long meeting. All right, so that brings us to closed session. Before we enter into closed session, there's an opportunity for public comment. Is this three minutes or two minutes? Two. Okay. Thank you, Emma. All right, Becky. Becky Steinbrenner. Um, I just want to talk with you, um, plead with you. I, I do not want to take that appeal to the state Supreme Court, but I will. And there are good grounds. The, um, I didn't bring it with me this time, but the appeal court did have a footnote saying they were disturbed by some of the case law that uh, your attorney cited. And it is exactly like the case Comunidad in Acción versus the city of Los Angeles. It is exactly alike. And the appeal court judges said that very thing during oral argument. So <clears throat> it isn't only a matter of um, my concern about the environmental, what I see as violations, and, and the lawsuit, the petition for writ of mandate that is the the case that is at, at hand. It, it isn't just about that. It's about the people's right to be able to have um, fair, impartial due process. And um, that's a principle I very much take to heart. And I hope you will too. I am willing to sit and at the table again I didn't think those meetings at the farm were non-productive. I thought they were actually quite excellent because I walked away thinking, President Jaffe, that you were really thinking about things that I had said and you would take them to heart. I didn't think, I thought it was quite productive. <laughs> so if I have a meeting, I would want it not at the farm bakery. I would want it with uh, President Jaffe, Vice President Lather, and staff and council. And I would like to settle but I will take it to Supreme Court if I have to. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So that brings us to closed session then. Yes. We're going to have a slight recess. <laughs> <laughs>